Today's gospel reading comes from the gospel according to John chapter 1. The next day John was again standing with two of his disciples and as he watched Jesus walk by he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means a teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated as anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Here ends our reading from the Gospel according to John. There are moments in our lives, and I'm certain you can relate to this, when it seems that everything just changes in an instant, days that you never forget. I think one of those days happened yesterday for the people of the state of Hawaii. We received a text message from my sister-in-law, Leslie, who lives in Hawaii. She was here a few weeks ago. You might remember meeting her. Uh, and she sent uh, an image of the emergency alert screen that showed up on her cell phone uh, saying that there is a ballistic missile headed toward Hawaii. Take shelter immediately. This is not a drill. Simultaneously, the televisions and radios all around the state uh, sounded an alarm. And for 38 agonizing minutes, people wondered what was happening. They, many of them, took shelter, panicked, hid in fear, hoping that it was a false alarm. And after 38 minutes, finally the message came through, oh yeah, it was just a false alarm. Don't worry about it. I don't think Leslie or any of the people in Hawaii that went through that experience would ever forget that day. There are times in your life that your world is rocked. Times when you hear a message about someone that you love who has died, and you never forget that. Days like 9-11, or the day that uh, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, or the day that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And you remember the time and the place, where you were and what you were doing when you got that news. Sometimes it can be very terrible news. Sometimes it can be wonderful news. You never forget where you met the love of your life. 
the place where the proposal took place. These are days when you wake up from your normal life and you never forget that time or that place again. It's a wake-up call. John chapter 1 tells of that kind of awakening, a spiritual awakening that took place in the lives of five people who became followers of Jesus. And they, it was like waking up from a slumber. Their world was rocked. They would never be the same because they met Jesus. I think there's an interesting detail that we read in John chapter 1 and verse 39, just a, kind of a curious detail that John throws out there. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when Andrew and the other disciple met Jesus. Whenever John is talking about this other disciple, he's talking about himself, but he doesn't like to talk about himself, so he just says Andrew and the other disciple. And he mentions this, you know what, it may well be that he writes that way because you know what, he could tell you the very hour. He could probably tell you the very stone by the road where he was standing in that moment when he met Jesus and his life changed forever. It was like waking up on that spring afternoon in Galilee when he met Jesus. And his life became a whole new thing for him. Jesus turns and asks him that question. What are you looking for? Curious kind of a question. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? What are you really trying to get out of life? What is it that matters most to you? What is it that you have come here searching for? Their answer seems at face value, kind of a dumb answer, uh, where do you stay? But I think it's more profound than that. Where do you stay? We want to know, I want to know, where is Jesus? Where can I really find Jesus? Is, is he real? Is this kingdom of God for real? Where can he be found? Where should I search? And Jesus' answer is equally profound and meaningful. Jesus' answer was, come and see. Come and see. Come and walk the walk. Don't just talk the talk. Live out this kingdom of God and see how your life will be changed. This was their moment of a great awakening. In Hawaii, most of the people there were asleep when that message came out. But what a rude awakening. And in their lives, too, they had been kind of asleep and they were called to something deeper. This was the moment that they would never forget in their lives. When they awoke from their slumber, their lives were changed forever. Their world was rocked. Andrew is one of the people who gets that call. Now, we don't hear a whole lot about Andrew in the Bible. He doesn't give any great sermons. He doesn't go on in the Acts of the Apostles to do extraordinary works. But there's one thing that Andrew does extraordinarily well and that is to recruit other people, to extend an invitation to them. Remember, Andrew was the one in the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes who said, well, there's this kid here who's got uh, five loaves and two fish. Maybe he could help, you know. He called that kid to come forward, and Jesus was able to work with that and do something great to feed 5,000 people. It was Andrew who called his brother, Simon Peter, of course, we hear a lot about Peter in the Bible, the great things that Peter did, and in the Acts of the Apostles after Jesus' death and resurrection, he goes on to announce that good news. Likewise, Philip is someone who calls other people. He's good at extending that uh, invitation. Unfortunately, he, he extends that invitation to a guy who's kind of, kind of Eeyore, you know, he's kind of cynical and, and negative. He calls Nathaniel. And he says, hey, guess what? I found someone that I believe is the Messiah. Uh, he is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. What's the first thing that Nathaniel says? <laughs> Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know? It seems that that was a saying that people were accustomed to saying at that time. It was an insulting comment. It was a prejudiced comment. Nazareth had a bit of a reputation, you see, as kind of a backwater town. It was about 300 to 400 people. 
back then. They lived in small stone houses and archaeological excavations tell us that the people just tossed out their garbage between the houses and excrement too. It was not known as a great place to hang out. Nathaniel then is repeating this oft-quoted saying at that time, could anything good come out of a place like that? Could anything good come out of Nazareth? Over the past few days, surely you've heard in the news this week terms that are too vulgar for me to repeat here, asking the question, why should we welcome those people from places like that? Why would we welcome people from such a place? Nazareth was known as such a place. And Jesus knew what it was to experience prejudice and hate and rejection. And perhaps it was for that reason that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25 that when you welcome the stranger, you welcome Jesus himself. Or perhaps he was simply recalling the words of Exodus uh, chapter 23 and verse 9, which stated clearly to Jesus and to us, Do not oppress an alien, for you yourselves know how it feels to be aliens, because you were once aliens yourselves. This message of Jesus comes in response to that question. Can anything good come out of such a place as Nazareth? Something good did come out of Nazareth indeed. Something good and wonderful. And Jesus responds to them as to us. Come and see. Come and see the something good did come from Nazareth. And they did come. And they did see. You know what they saw? They saw a seed grow into the kingdom of God. They saw lives transformed and a society that was transformed. And that transformation and that growth continues to this day. And if this church, the Richfield United Church of Christ, which this year celebrates our bicentennial, is going to continue to grow and to thrive for the next 200 years, then we, like John the Baptist and Andrew and Philip, first of all, need to come and see. Accompany Jesus. Walk with Jesus on that path of the kingdom of God. But secondly, as did Philip and uh, Andrew, invite others, call other people to come and see. Next Sunday, uh, as I would mentioned, you know, we're going to have a guest speaker. That's a great opportunity. A little foot in the door there. Extend that invitation to a friend, to a family member. Come with me. Come and see what this is all about. Now, Samuel, as we read in the book of the prophet Samuel today, he was asleep. And, you know, he hears this call. And you can tell there's kind of an experience of confusion and frustration on the part of both Samuel and Eli. Hey, do you mind? I'm trying to sleep here. I'm trying to get a little bit of rest. Leave me alone. Stop bugging me. Leave me in my comfort zone. But they hear that call. And everything changes when he says, speak to me, Lord. I am listening. Your servant is listening. Samuel the disciples and we are awakened because we came and we saw an unforgettable, life-changing moment where it seems that everything has changed, like waking up from a slumber. In the life of Martin Luther King Jr., something likewise awakened him. And there was a moment of this awakening from a kind of a slumber. Martin Luther King Jr., whose holiday we celebrate, we commemorate tomorrow as a nation, was a prophet, was a pastor, 
who had a spiritual awakening that led to the awakening of the conscience of a nation and led to social change and social justice, to peace and equality, but also to discomfort and to conflict. And it's easy sometimes from our perspective now, so many years out, to forget what that discomfort was like. Like those kids in the children's sermon that we're talking about, you know, I'd rather just stay sound asleep. Do you mind? Would you just leave me alone? I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to wake up. And something like that was going on in the time of Martin Luther King Jr. Something awakened in the nation that walked with him to freedom. When Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested in Birmingham, Alabama, April the 12th, 1963, after peaceful protests, there was a letter that was published in the local newspaper, and it was written by seven white pastors and a rabbi who together published two articles. One of them had the very compelling title, An Appeal for Law and Order and Common Sense. Now that sounds like a good article, doesn't it? It's the kind of article I, I would like to write. An appeal for law and order and common sense. And the second letter that they published was titled, A Call to Unity. Ah, oh, come on, everybody. Let's all stick together. Come on. But in those two letters, what they were doing, they accused Martin Luther King Jr. of being, and these are their words, a rabble rouser, an anarchist, an extremist, someone who's trying to stir up trouble. The religious folks of his time were basically saying, now come on, Martin, you know your place. Why don't you just stay in your place? Keep quiet, Martin. Stay with your people. Why are you trying to stir up so much trouble? How do you expect us white ministers to get any rest around here when you keep trying to stir up so much nonsense? Maybe when you're sleeping, like Samuel, it's really nice just not to be disturbed, not to be awakened. None of us like that. Well, you know what? Martin Luther King Jr. was a disturbance, and he awakened the soul of a nation, and he awakened those segregationalist religious leaders. In response, Martin Luther King Jr., wrote what had become known as his Letters from a Birmingham Jail. Beautiful, powerful writing that directly addressed in part what those seven pastors and rabbi had published in those two letters. Martin Luther King Jr. embraces that title of being called an extremist. He says, yeah, I'm an extremist. I'm an extremist for love. And he cites historical figures throughout the history of Christianity, people like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, in claiming that not only is nonviolent civil disobedience sanctioned by our Christian faith, it is oftentimes required, demanded by our Christian faith, that we resist the powers of oppression. The letters from a Birmingham jail were a wake-up call to the religious folks of his time who were dormant in the face of government and societal abominations and structural injustices that were taking place at that time. Again, from our place in history, in retrospect, it's easy for us to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. as a great leader of a national awakening. But at that time, it didn't quite feel that way to many people. Samuel was trying to sleep. They were trying to sleep, but they heard something that awakened them to the voice of the Spirit. And Nathaniel and Philip were going about their lives just a normal, regular day when suddenly everything was disturbed. Everything was changed. Martin Luther King Jr. disturbed those sleepy segregationalists from their evil slumber. The gospel comforts the afflicted, but the gospel afflicts the comfortable. The Spirit stirs us out of our complacency, rouses us from our slumber, and rocks our world in ways that are unforgettable. Martin Luther King Jr. told us of a dream, but he also awakened us from our dreams to a new reality. As the Spirit of God woke Samuel, and as Jesus 
woke those followers. May the Spirit of God awaken us and rouse us to a new awareness, ready to respond in love, ready to serve, ready to heal, ready to embrace. Oh, yeah, something good did come from Nazareth, didn't it? So let us walk with Jesus. Yes, come and see. You might not get much sleep, but that's okay. You might be awakened from your slumber, but that's okay. You might even be called to be a disciple, and that's a good thing. And you might invite others. You might call others, as did Andrew and Philip, to be disciples too, to come and see where Jesus dwells. In a beautiful church, yes, 200 years old, but not merely this church. Come and see more than that. Come and see a spiritual awakening. Come and see the kingdom of God growing from that tiny seed, growing within us. Come and see where Jesus dwells. God bless you.